afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us today uh, as our round one pace grantees for FY24. We want to start off with uh, congratulations. I know there was a lot of work, hard work and effort put into the creation of those applications and to get them submitted on time. Um, I know the process that we put you guys through as far as panel review and uh, report reporting back to you on whether or not you've been approved all take time. Um, you know, we're in the process now of contract completion and submittal on your side. I know uh, Lauren had sent that email out to you guys last week, so those steps um, are something that you'll need to work on. And if anybody has any questions, obviously you can feel free to ask at the end of the presentation today. The goal today is to really introduce you guys to pace again <laughs> uh, and to um, introduce you to the reporting process that you'll have to start working on as you begin um, accepting participants into your pre-apprenticeship programs. So uh, first things first, my name is Bill Sarbuck. I am the uh, supervisor here in the Office of Apprenticeship. I oversee all of the grants that we um, issue here in the New Jersey Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Um, my colleague Lauren Kremper Filippo is here with us. Uh, she'll speak a little bit in a couple minutes. Uh, she is the technical assistant within the unit that works specifically with our PACE grant. We have a new member of our team with us today, Heather Wilson, who uh, just joined us uh, today, is her first day actually <laughs> with our unit. So welcome to Heather. She'll be uh, in time taking over the reporting reviews and approvals, um, but ultimately initially she's going to be learning just like everybody else on uh, how we do things and what we do um, within the unit and uh, we'll get her up to speed, but you guys will start hearing from her on occasion uh, in the next few months. Um, we have Al Nixon who's not with us today. for the weekend for his birthday so happy birthday to al hopefully he had a good time um but he works specifically right now currently with our uh, yttw grants our youth transitions to work grants and our our gains grant our growing apprenticeship and non-traditional sectors grant um and then uh some of you have worked in the past with uh tammy novatin who's also a part of our team who is uh going to be coming back here in the next few weeks but has been out on maternity leave for a period of time so we're looking forward to seeing her and having her join us back but she'll be uh working her way back into what we do uh here in the next few weeks so uh, we have an assistant director over our area uh james manning who um, some of you know um, and he also is involved in everything that we do on a regular basis so you may hear his name and or see him or speak with him on occasion but ultimately that's the team that's our office of apprenticeship and work-based learning um what I'd like to now is get started on the presentation and then get into really showing you guys the user guides for our activity and expenditure reports, which I think will help to uh, explain to you what's expected of you on a monthly basis for reporting purposes um, and also help to hopefully ease any concerns you have. Some of you I know have been working with us in the past and have done these processes already, so for you, um, this should be elementary information, but um, for anybody who's here, if you have any questions while we're going through the slides, please feel free to uh, share them in the chat. We'll get to them at the end uh, or wait until we're done with the presentation and then we'll ask anybody who wants to unmute themselves to ask any questions they may have. Uh, for those of you who are joining us uh, a couple minutes late here, just know we're recording the session. Uh, we will provide the recording to you. You didn't miss much. It was mostly introductory. Uh, we will get into uh, next steps towards the end of the presentation, but ultimately we're going to go over <clears throat> the expectations of the PACE grant as well as the monthly um, reporting requirements of all of our grantees. So without further ado, we'll get started with the presentation. So we had seven awarded contracts in this round one of PACE. As you can see, uh, each of you will be listed here with the occupations in which you applied for and the number of participants you're looking to serve. Um, 
these grantees, some of you have been grantees in the past, uh, whether it be with our PACE grant or other grants that we've had, but um, know that we do create a directory with this information to share with providers uh, out there or participants that might be interested. Uh, that information will be shared uh, out with them, and if you guys ever needed or wanted to have a copy of that, you could reach out and we could share that with you as well. Uh, Lauren could definitely get that to you if you had any required if you were re interested in obtaining anything. <clears throat> As was said with during the. Um, during the uh, technical assistance workshops and within the grant, grant opportunity, it is a requirement that all of your participants get registered with the one stop system that will be done through job source, which is a website that is specifically attached to uh, the Department of Labor. Uh, once you have your participants log on to the job source website here, they'll click create, create a free account. They'll complete the registration process and that will make sure they're registered with the one stop or update their information with the one stop if they were registered previously. This is mandatory for all participants. This allows for us to ensure that all of our participants are aware of the one stop services that are available to them. It also uh, provides them with um, information right here on the job source website on things like resume writing um, and and uh, job application uh, completion. So some of this stuff is useful and helpful to them, but more importantly, it updates their information within our database so that if any other services are available to them, uh, that is they're kind of ready to get those types of services. Uh, this process is in the process of being updated a little bit. Uh, not that job source won't still be used, but ultimately we, we are um, also creating another form that allows for the one stop staff to really kind of um, check and balance what the participants needs are. And if they feel a need to reach out to them, then they can reach out and schedule appointments with them for additional resources and services to be provided the, with the goal being <clears throat> that we're not duplicating resources uh, both through your grants and through services that are already readily available to them at the one stop system. Um, that will hopefully help eliminate some of those duplication of services and save your organizations as well as um, the state uh, as a whole um, resources to utilize for other more important things that maybe uh, that wouldn't have already been provided in some capacity somewhere else. So, but right now the job source website is where you'll have all of your participants go to register uh, with the one stop. I'm going to hand it over now to Lauren who's going to speak more about the deliverables and the expectations of the PACE grant. Good afternoon, everyone. So the goals of PACE is to create a pipeline of qualified individuals and enable them to transition into sustainable career pathways, present opportunities to underrepresented and or disadvantaged populations, drive economic development through skills and educational attainment, and promote the value of pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship programs. The responsibilities and expected outcomes are that you enroll a minimum number of participants into your pre-apprenticeship program as outlined in your proposal. Ensure that 80% of participants graduate and are placed into one of the following. 25% into a US DOL approved registered apprenticeship program, post-secondary education, or employment at a rate of no lower than $16 per hour. You're to maintain records and report report program activities on a monthly basis and provide follow up support services to your participants. So because I know that some of the language we use gets a little bit confusing uh, for clarity purposes, I just want to make sure. So the enrolling is the number that you saw on slide this, the, that slide earlier when we had your organization and a number of participants you said you were going to train. That's how many participants you'll enter into your pre apprenticeship training program. 80% of those are expected to complete the pre-apprenticeship part of your training. Um, of that 80%, a minimum of 25% of those have to enter into registered apprenticeship. That's 
requirement of pace. It's a pre-apprenticeship program, so we we have a requirement that 25% minimally enter into registered apprenticeship. It could obviously be way more than 25% that enter into registered apprenticeship, um, but ultimately that's the requirement. Um, Post-secondary education and employment at a rate of no lower than $16 an hour, the other 75% of that 80% of participants who graduate would then be required to go into one of those two. So hopefully that's clear. I know there's a lot of random numbers there, but just know it is negotiated. It's on your deliverables page within your applications. So if you look on those deliverables pages, you'll see these numbers. They're already what you submitted in your application telling us that you were going to do. So everything was in line with those requirements already. So if you look at the deliverables page or within the contract details page of your contract, you'll see these numbers. Uh, exactly what you've negotiated with us already and what we've accepted. Um, if for some reason you need to reach out to us and have a conversation, this is the time to have a conversation about those deliverables. Don't wait any longer than now to have those conversations because the contracts are going to get signed by both you and our commissioner. And at that point, we're pretty much bound to those requirements. So if you have any questions or, or concerns with the negotiated deliverables, reach out to Lauren and we can have a further discussion at that time. The deliverable dates. So your contract period started on February 15th, 2024, and will go through August 14th of 2025. Your activity and expenditure reports are due by the 15th of every month. By the end of the contract period, a minimum number of participants must have completed the program and acquired a quality placement. Those are those numbers we just went over. Um, before I hand this back over to Bill, I'm just going to ask that in the chat section, you put your organization name and the person who will be handling your activity report and or your expenditure report, just so I have the contact for each um, for each report. Thank you. Of your yeah, and um, another important piece for you all to understand is um, all of your participants have to be New Jersey residents. We are not capable of allowing for the funds to be used for training for anybody who's not who's not a New Jersey resident. So it's just another piece of information that's useful for, for us to share with you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make sure I shared that now. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to a different slideshow because I need to show you the user guides for um, gains I mean, for the PACE program for the expenditure reports and the uh, activity reports. So. Teams has been acting up today, if you can't tell. All right, that's better. Lauren, can you see this? The screen? Are you muted? I can't hear you. Never get used to it. Yep, I can see <laughs> your screen. I think I got it worked out now finally. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Um, I had to do this before you guys joined us as well. Um, 
when I was on the first slideshow. And I'll probably have to do it again when I switch back to the old slideshow. You know how it goes. Um, so this is a user guide. We will provide this user guide to you, but we're going to go through it page by page so that you'll understand uh, once you start to um, create, initiate your reports and and um, what they look like and what expectations are of you on each of these pages. So we're going to start with the um, activity reports, but ultimately um, just know that uh, every month on the 15th of the month, the expectation is that you're going to send in a report for the previous month's um, services and expenditures. So if we're in the month of March and you're submitting a report, you should be submitting February of 2024's report. If we're in the month of April and you're submitting a report, you should be submitting March of 2024's reports. If that hopefully makes sense, but ultimately it's always the previous month's report. Uh, it is due by the 15th of every month. If you're running into trouble and you can't get it done by the 15th of the month, it is perfectly acceptable for you to reach out to Lauren and ask for an extension. It is not acceptable for you to not reach out to her and just expect that we'll wait for you. So please, please try to make sure you keep communication lines open and available with Lauren so that and the team so that we can ensure that we're aware we're not bothering you. Um, remember your one grantee out of many that she's responsible for reviewing and approving. Um, so for her to have to reach out and find you and get in touch with you on a monthly basis in order to get the report submitted, it really ultimately becomes very time consuming and frustrating. So at the end of the day, we are perfectly understand understanding when it comes to the need for additional time uh, for any reason, really, uh, as long as you keep that communication line in place and you let us know. Um, but ultimately, the reports are expected to be submitted in the middle of the month. That way we can have time to review them before next month's reports start coming in. Um, and then um, ultimately your next month's reports will not be able to be started until we've reviewed and approved the previous month's reports. So it slows you down if you miss or if you get get behind, let's just say, you know, so just some basic information to share. There is a monthly activity report and the monthly expenditure report that you're going to have to do every month. Um, the activity report is 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 more detailed. The expenditure report is really just telling you what telling us what you've spent in the previous month on the program so we can reimburse you for those costs. We are a reimbursement model, so you cannot request funds that weren't already expended from the grant. You must um, front the funds and then we repay you back um, in the, the, uh, the next month. So everybody here is familiar with the IGX database at this point. They registered their applications this way and should be registered in the database. If you have a staff member who's not registered in the database, um, they'll have to log, they'll have to create a, a new user profile. Um, under that login button, it says um, new user. They'll click that and they can register for the database. Once they do that, though, they need to email Lauren so that she can go in and approve that registration and add them to the application and to the reports going forward. Uh, without that step being followed, we won't know that the registration was submitted and we won't be able to go in and approve that person. So if you have a staff member who's not currently in the database that will be doing reports uh, to submit on a monthly basis, they need to register with IGX. Um, and then email Lauren and let her know that they registered uh, so that we can um, give them access. Once we give them access, then they'll come to this website, uh, njdol.intelligrants.com, and log in with their username and password. For those of you who registered already, this is where you'll enter your username and password as well. I'm sure you have a basic memory of this, but when you log in, it'll bring you to a dashboard page. The dashboard page will initially show your application right in your My Tasks. That's not that's going to show up there right now for all of you because it's in a status where it's awaiting your signature for contract. For those of you who have already signed off on the contract pages and submitted it, you will not see your contract here on the My Tasks. I mean your application here on the My Tasks page. You'll have to go to the searches button at the top. Click searches, go to my documents, and then in my documents, you can do a search for your PACE application. Uh, I believe. Yes, so here's this. So you go to searches, you can go to my documents. You can also hover over the recent documents and you might find your application right in recent documents. 
but otherwise you click on my documents you choose the drop down under type find pace application 2024 round one click search when you do so under documents at, uh, you'll see your application pull up and you just click on the hyperlink under name that'll bring you into your application so that you can start the process of completing your um, uh, monthly reports Once you've gone into the application itself, you'll scroll all the way down in the menu to the left where your application pages are, and you'll find related documents at the bottom. And right underneath that, you'll see initiate related document. You'll click on initiate related document, and that will bring up a, a text box that you see here. Uh, it'll, it'll automatically populate the parent document based on you being in your application. You'll have to choose the drop down under available documents and you'll look for the activity report that you're looking to create. So for you guys, your grant started on February 15th. So your first report is technically going to be a March report. You're not going to do a February report. You'll do a February and March report combined in April. So your first reports are actually going to do a be due April 15th. It doesn't make sense for me to have you do a, a February report for 15 days. I don't feel like that's beneficial to you guys, so we'll give you the ability to combine your February and March reports and submit them in April by April 15th. That'll be your your first due date for activity reports and expenditure reports. So you would open this page, choose the drop down and find March 2024 activity report. You see it says pace activity report and you'll find March 2024. Once you choose that, you'll click create. It will want to make sure that you're sure you really want to do so because that's what Sage and IGX does. It never takes your word for it the first time. It always requires multiple times being told what you want to do. You'll click agree. And it will create your report. It'll actually bring you right into your report initially. As I've told you in the previous previously, if at that time you're like, OK, I have the report started, but I don't have time to really fill it out right now. I'll come back to it later. When you log back into the database, the report will show up in your My Tasks on your dashboard. You'll see it there. You'll click on the hyperlink that's on their name and it'll bring you right back into the report. But these pages that you see here on the left hand side are the actual forms that are a part of your activity report. Just like you had forms within the application, you have forms within these reports that need to be completed. Each one of them has a box next to it that is blank. Initially, if you don't have any participants, please don't open the participant list page and save it. There's no need to. If you don't have participants yet, leave it blank. Don't save it because what happens is when you go in and save that participant list page, it automatically creates a quality placement and activity page and it's a blank page and I then have to go in and delete it for you just slowing you down I'd rather not slow you down if you don't have participants in the first month leave the participant list page with a blank box next to it um, the quality partner page might be blank as well if you've already got quality partners that you'd like to enter you can enter them at this time um, but we'll get into each one of these pages here in a second So as I said, the first page is the participant list page. This is what the page looks like. When you open the participant list page, you have a plus sign all the way to the right that you see circle well squared here on this page. That plus sign is how you add additional participants. Please don't click add at the top. By clicking add at the top, what that does is create a whole new page. I don't want to have 30 pages for 30 participants. I could have all 30 participants listed on one page. So if you click the plus sign, it creates a new text box for you to enter a new participant. All of the fields that you see here listed on the page are required except for the AOSOS ID number, but everything else is a required field. Um, if you get the AOSOS ID number from the participants or from somebody else, you can enter it here, but it's not mandatory. Um, ultimately, you'll provide us first name, last name, a street address, uh, their date of birth, gender, uh, what cycle they're in for your your program, uh, race, ethnicity, and their highest level of education. Once you've completed entering a participant, I would suggest you save them so that you don't lose it if something was to happen. Then you'll hit the plus sign and you could add your next participant. As I said, if you don't have any participants in the first month, please don't save this page. Leave it blank and don't do anything with it. 
um, but ultimately you'll enter all of your participants on the participant list page once you actually start adding them. Um, and like I said, by clicking the plus signs, it'll give you more boxes to enter more participants. The quality partner page works very similarly, but this is where you're going to list your partners. These are the partners for outcome purposes. So any partners that are registered apprenticeship partners you'll list here. This is where you'll list your employers that you work with, post-secondary vocational training providers that you are placing individuals with. You may not have anybody listed here initially because obviously you don't have outcomes occurring from day one of your program because you still have a whole pre-apprenticeship training program that you need to provide. But this, you can enter this information ahead of time. It allows for you to do so, even though outcomes may not have already started, especially for those of you who have long lasting partnerships with specific quality partners, you can enter them here. Once again, use the plus sign at the end to create another one for them. Um, ultimately on this page, every field is required, um, I think except for the FEIN number on this page, but all other fields are required on this page. Uh, same thing, once you've entered a quality partner, make sure you save the page. The quality partner type is where you're gonna choose whether they're a registered apprenticeship provider, an employer, or a post-secondary vocational school. OK, you only want to choose one of those three. Um, and then when under quality partner, that's where you'll type their name, the name of the partner. Um, if for some reason you add so many quality partners, it won't let you add any additionals. That's when you'll click the add button at the top to create a new page. But if there's a plus sign at the end, always use the plus sign. Um, make sure you save regularly on this page because you don't want to lose your your data that's entered, but ultimately this data all pulls forward to the next month's report as well. Same for the participant list. So you don't have to re-enter this information every month. You'll enter it and then the next month when you go in, that data will already be there. The next page is the quality placement and activity page. As you enter these individuals on the participant list page, the system will automatically create quality placement and activity pages for each of those participants. What you'll see is the arrow next to the quality placement and activity page, and when you hover over it, it'll pull up all of the quality placement pages for each individual. In the initial month, you need to go into each one of these pages and fill out the information that's required to kind of get their st information started. And then on a monthly basis, you'll go in there and update anything additional that has happened. So if outcomes occur, if uh, you've helped them obtain information uh, like driver's license and stuff like that, we'll get into all that in a second. Um, but ultimately, you'll have to come in and complete these quality placement pages on a monthly basis if there's updates. In the initial months, though, when you first add somebody to participant list, you will have to go into each one of them. There'll be an exclamation point next to it, just like you see on the page right now. Um, you have to open those, add the information that's required for each of those individuals and save the page. Uh, until you do that, it'll have these errors on the page and it won't let you submit your report. This is what the quality placement and activity report looks like. Top part is going to pre-fill with the participant name and unique ID. The system creates a unique ID for your participants on the participant list page. You'll enter their progress as a participant in the program when they were enrolled. You do not enter a completion date until they've completed. So please don't enter their entry and completion date from day one. Only enter their completion date when they complete the pro the training program, the pre-apprenticeship training program. If you lose them and they stop showing up, you will never enter a completion date. You'll enter an exit reason. The exit reason tells us that the participant um, unsatisfactorily left and they're no longer participating in the program. Um, quality partner information will be entered if you have an outcome for your participant. So if your participant got a job making $16 an hour or more, you'll choose the drop down under type of quality outcome, choose employment of $16 or more. That under quality partner will automatically create a drop down as well. You'll choose the partner that you already entered on your quality partner page. See what I'm saying? So it checks and, and pulls that information to this page so that you don't have to enter all of that employer information over and over and over again. You're only entering it once on the quality partner page. You'll enter their NAICS code, which can be found just by Googling it if you don't know. 
it off top uh, add the trade and occupation in which they received employment and their their previous hourly wage, which would have been anything they made prior. So in their most recent job, previous hourly wage, what their starting hourly wage is on this job. And if it's an apprenticeship, then you'll enter the status of an apprenticeship. If it's not, you do not enter anything. Uh, you also don't enter anything in the date of apprenticeship cancellation or the date of apprenticeship com completion unless you chose apprenticeship and they've either canceled their apprenticeship or they've completed their apprenticeship. Under credential information, you'll enter the credential in which your participants received. All participants required to receive at least one credential. So you'll enter the credential. Most most of them, your participants may have multiples. You'll enter the type of credential, the number of hours for the training to get the credential, and then the date they receive the credential. If they receive multiples, you use the plus sign and just add a second one underneath it. College credit information, same thing. Add the number of college credits that were awarded, the, to the course that they received it for, and the number of credits and the date in which those credits were issued to the participants. Use the plus sign if that happens multiple times. Please make sure you're saving this page regularly through it and or make sure you're saving it at the end of entering all of this data. Um, once again, initially, the only pieces of information that you need to enter up front for your participants are participant progress and program enrollment date. That's what you're going to enter for all of your participants on the first month that they've been added to your program. The rest of this information will be added as things are received or as outcomes are obtained for your participants. So that's where I'm saying you'll enter the rest of this information on an as needed basis on a month to month basis. You do want to make sure you keep this as up to date as possible because you don't want us saying, hey, you're contracted to place 20 participants and you haven't placed any and we only have four months left in the grant. Oh, well, no, I have them placed. They just haven't entered it into the database yet. That's a bad answer. Please don't ever say that <laughs> because at the end of the day, this is what we use to make sure you're on track to complete your grant. We don't necessarily have communication. We're not sitting in your office. We're not walking into those classrooms like you guys do. We need to be able on a, at a glance, see where you're at at all times in meeting the outcomes of the grant. So make sure you're entering this information in on a monthly basis and keeping it as up to date as possible. If you have any participants and you've budgeted for stipends, you have to complete the stipend page. Um, you'll you'll choose the name and the drop down from your participant list. Enter the stipend cost for the month. Next month, they'll automatically show up on this report. And what will happen is anything that was entered in previous months for stipends, it'll show up in the cumulative costs. Please don't enter a participant more than once on your stipend page. It shouldn't let you. There is an error in the system to check and balance that. But if for some reason it does let you, we have to have you combine it and delete it out. It's it's a whole mess. You'll check the checkbox under stipend received if you've issued the stipend to the participants already. You should only be reporting on issuance of stipends because what we look at here is that the stipend costs add up to total what your uh, expenditure report shows that you're asking for for the stipends for that month. So if you budget if you budget for 20,000 and this month you're asking for 6,000 for stipends, this month's stipend cost should show 6,000 worth of stipends, $6,000, excuse me, worth of stipends that you've issued out. And your cumulative costs should show what you've cumulatively expended on, on stipends to this point. Make sure you save this page and also use the plus sign once again um, in order to add additional stipend recipients. The final page of the activity report is a dashboard page. The dashboard page you'll enter at the top the grant project director, which would be the person who oversees your grant program at your organization. You must enter a monthly program status comment. That's what tells us where you're at, if you're having any problems, if you have any questions, if you're, you know, what the next steps are, what you're expecting to do, all that kind of detail. It doesn't have to be 10 pages long. It can be just one sentence, but it needs to be clear and explain to us where you're at and if you're having any struggles. All the demographic data will pull in automatically uh, as well as. Oops, just jumped on me, sorry. 
uh, as well as the quality placement outcomes will pull in automatically from the placement pages. Uh, you'll notice underneath that there's a program activities and outcomes section. That's where it's going to list the cycles, the start and end dates you're going to enter for those cycles, and you're going to put in any comments, uh, and those comments should include at a minimum the course name for that cycle, description of the course and updates that to the activities that were received during the reporting month. Um, you can provide us with any additional comments as you feel necessary, but there's ultimately a section for you to enter up to six cycles there. At the bottom, there's a whole bunch of pieces of data that are collected automatically. It pulls in the numbers from your placement pages. If any of those numbers ever don't match your records, let us know. We can check and see what's what's causing the issue. Sometimes it's a database issue. Sometimes, sometimes it's something you've done and we can help you figure out what you did wrong. Uh, but if you have any numbers in the bottom of this section, you want to make sure you put a comment next to it so we understand what if there's any problems with your participants or what you're doing moving forward. But this dashboard page mostly completes itself. There's only a few sections that you got to enter pieces of information and there's only one dashboard page. Once you've completed those pages and you're ready to, you think you're ready to submit, the last thing we ask you to do is to scroll down under tools and click document validation. That just validates that there's no errors on any of the pages that you've completed. If any pages show up here, you click on the form name and it'll bring you back to the page where an error is. Correct the error to get rid of it. And then once you've completed correcting all these errors, come back down, do a document validation. It should show up that there's no errors on any pages. Once you've done that, then you can move to the next step. The next step is submitting your activity report. You'll scroll down under status options, which is just below the tools section. Uh, and choose activity report submitted. Once you choose that, this text box will pop up asking if you're sure that you want to change the status. You'll click OK, and that will submit your activity report for the month. Um, you'll then want to move on to initiating and completing your expenditure report. This process is much less involved as far as steps and forms. But ultimately, you should do them in this order. You should do your activity reports first, then your expenditure reports. We will not approve an expenditure report without an activity report being submitted first. That activity report is what tells us what what you've done in the previous month, therefore explaining why you have billing. So uh, initially, your first step in creating an expenditure report is no different than it was in creating an uh, activity report. You log into your application using those same first steps that we already went over. Scroll down on the related documents and choose initiate a related document. When you do that, once again, the parent document name will automatically populate because you're in there. You'll choose the available documents drop down and you'll find pace expenditure report and for the month that you're looking to create it. Like I said, if it's March, you're creating February's report. If it's April, you're creating March's report, so on and so forth. Once you create, click on the, the appropriate expenditure report that you need to create, you'll click create. It will ask you if you're sure, you'll click agree. And it'll bring you right into your expenditure report. No different than it was for the activity report. If you are not ready to complete it now, you can come back later. It'll show up in my tasks until you submit it. Um, but if you're interested in completing it right then, <coughs> excuse me, all the pages will show up right here that need to be completed. You'll click on Pace Expenditure Report first because that is the first page um, that you'll need to complete. This is what the expenditure report will look like. It'll look just like your cost summary within your budget. Ultimately, it'll list all the cost categories that you budgeted funds for and the approved grant amount that we already approved based on what you submitted as a budget. In the first month, the amount expended to data obviously shows zero for everything. The current expenses full section is what you're going to complete on a monthly basis. So last month, this is what I expended on salaries. This is what I expended on accounting and, and auditing services. If you didn't expend anything, then it should show a zero there. But if you expended something in the previous month, then this is where you would show it. You have to have your backup on file in order to be able to provide for audit purposes, but ultimately this is where you're going to tell us what we need to reimburse you for. 
You need to make sure your available balance is always a positive number. If you submit a report with a negative number in your available balance, we'll be sending it back to you and making you make adjustments. The reason being is uh, you didn't budget for that amount, so we can't allow for you to expend the money in that line item. If for some reason you needed to do a budget modification, then that's a totally different process. You'd reach out to Lauren and we'd give you the information on how to start that process. But ultimately, all you need to do on a monthly basis is enter your current expenses on this page. Once you've done so, save the page and you're completed. You can and need to and must submit this report even if you have no current expenses. So if there's all zeros, you save the page and you submit your report with the zero expenditure report. Miscellaneous attachments is where you can upload any supporting documentation. We don't mandate that you update upload any supporting documentation, but sometimes the grantees find it easier to have it in one place so they don't have to go searching for it through all of their records. Uh, if you want to upload it here, upload it here. We can take a look at it, but ultimately we will ne not necessarily look at it unless we have questions or concerns about your monthly billing. But this page, uh, you'll find that there's a description section that needs to be filled out and an upload. You'll enter the upload, which you know can be an Excel document. It can be a Word document. It's really up to you what you want to use in order to upload. But um, there'll be a plus sign next to this that you use in order to create a new section for a miscellaneous attachment. You can upload as many as you need to, and you could add pages if you need to add pages. This is not, as I said, a mandatory page, but ultimately we have it here if, if needed and if necessary. The final thing that you'll need to complete, this is mandatory, is a payment voucher. If you've got no billing for the month, the payment voucher will show up with zero dollars on it. You got to check that box under payee declaration, save the page, and that's all, that's all you need to do. If you had any billing on your expenditure report, that total amount will show that amount here. So you just want to verify that it matches what was on your expenditure report. Then check the box for the payee declaration and save the page. You can enter a description of the item below, but it doesn't really show up anywhere. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't show up anywhere. I've asked our fiscal department many, many times, but it still doesn't, and there's not much I can do about that. But ultimately, no, that this payment voucher is a mandatory form. And the majority of the time, all you're going to need to do is come here, verify the amount under total amount is equal to what was on your expenditure report, check the box for pay declaration, and save the page. Once you've done that, then you'll want to do a document validation once again under tools. Make sure you don't have any errors on your pages. After you've done so, then you'll scroll down the status options, choose the status option of expenditure report submitted, review required, click OK, and that will submit your expenditure report. At this point, you have submitted both your expenditure report, oh, excuse me, and your activity report and you no longer have to worry about reports for us for this month. Uh, you're good until next month. This is something you're going to do on a monthly basis, as I said, and they are due by the 15th of the month, but those are the procedures and the user guides for those two reports. Um, I know it seems like a lot right now, but I promise you once you get in there and start doing it, 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 it really will kind of make more sense to you and it, it should um, become easier and clearer in the long run. Um, so with that, I just want to show you a couple of additional slides. Um, instead of making it a presenter view, I'm just going to leave it here. These are the contacts for USDOL um, and, and their counties. If for any reason your registered apprenticeships uh, partnership isn't working out and you need to reach out to them and see if there's any additional registered apprenticeship programs that you can make connections with, you can reach out and see whether or not. A lot of this can be done also at uh, um, if you just Google USDOL registered apprenticeships and go to their USDOL website, there's there's searches that can be done on based on county, based on occupations to see what kind of registered apprenticeship programs are out there. You can do it right through that, really get contact information on those registered apprenticeship programs and to reach out to them. But just know um, this is contact information for USDOL. If you decided that you wanted to create your own registered apprenticeship program, you could reach out to them and, and work on that process. 
Contact information for us here in the Office of Apprenticeship. James Manning, as I said, is the Assistant Director of Office of Apprenticeship. Uh, myself, Bill Sarbuck, I'm the Supervisor. And then you can email all of us within the unit by just using the apprenticeship unit at dol.nj.gov email address list at the bottom. I usually suggest you use that because it comes to me and the rest of my team, not just me, so that way I can make sure an answer gets out to you as quickly as possible. I am actually going to be out on vacation starting Thursday, so I won't be back for um, the full week next week after that. And also I'll be back that Monday. I think it's April 7th. Um, but either way, I just want to make sure that if you guys have any questions or need anything, you have somebody to reach out to and it's easiest if you use the apprenticeship unit at dol.nj.gov email address. With that. I'd like to open it up for questions, comments. I know Lauren had asked you each to enter in the chat the names and contact information for everybody who's going to be completing activity and expenditure reports for your organization. Um, so please make sure you do that before you exit the meeting. Otherwise, let me check and make sure there weren't any questions in the chat. Do we collect the proof of residency? No, we don't necessarily need a proof of residency for us. Um, uh, ultimately, we just ask that you um, are verifying residency and th that you have the ability to provide it if necessary. Adarina, so yes, the reason you're seeing no related documents available for the selected parent document right now is because your contracts have to be signed off on first. So Lauren sent out instructions already uh, to get the contract signed off on. Once you get them signed off on and submitted to us, then we will give you a use the user guides that we just went over and um, make sure that the reports are open and ready for you to start. all the questions I had. I want to make sure I don't have any additional questions. Does anybody have anything they're going to type in the what is the all right? So what is the timeline for receiving the funds after we submit the vouchers and reports? So. It's a little more difficult for me to answer this question because there's a lot of pieces involved in this. So once you submit to us your expenditure reports and your activity reports, we have to review them approve them, then they, then they come to me for approval after it's approved by a staff member. I can I double check and make sure there's nothing missing. Uh, then we submit it to fiscal and they do the final payments. Um, the payments then go through Treasury and that and it depends on how your NJ start accounts were set up with Treasury. You know, some of you have physical checks coming out and going to your organization. Some of you have direct deposit set up with them. Um, if it's direct deposit, it'll be there much faster. If it's physical checks, it could take seven to ten days. You know, I, I really can't specifically answer that based on how long it takes uh, mailing for you. So I would say, you know, at the end of the day, um, Usually I say 30, 30 days, 30 to 45 days is when you should get your check back uh, from us. Um, but ultimately, uh, as soon as we possibly can, we approve them and review them. We don't let them sit around and wait. So uh, we usually try to get them done within 24 to 48 hours on our end. Um, you know, at the worst, maybe three or four days. Um, sometimes we get busier in the year uh, and, and that takes a couple extra days, but you know, we, we definitely try to get the payments made as, as quickly as we can. Um, do we need to submit any pay stubs? Pay stubs are not um, required for us because there is no on the job training funds that we issue through PACE. Um, you should have those pay stubs on record so that if you needed to be able to show proof of salary, that you're budgeting for and billing for that you have it available at any time, but it isn't mandatory that you have it submitted to us. Like I said, that miscellaneous attachment section is not mandatory. You can use it, uh, especially for yourselves, if you feel like it keeps things organized and clean for yourselves. I find that it would be really easy if I just put all my billing in there so that I could just refer back to it if anybody ever questions me on anything, rather than having to go figure it out and search through all my other records, but that's really up to you if you want to use it that way. It's not mandatory that you use it that way. Do 
additional questions in the chat. Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Yes, hi, this is Shinsia from Berg Community College. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. So um, I was surprised that the it started on February 15, 2024. Um, so we, we haven't had any, we haven't worked on it yet. Mm -hmm. We were waiting for this meeting to begin and understand what we have to do moving forward. Mm -hmm. So we will have to put in a report for February and March, even though we haven't done any work on this grant yet. Yep. Like I said, it'll just show zero participants at this point um, and zero billing at this point. Um, but ultimately, you'll submit those reports. Uh, your notice of award, which was what was issued out to you when we told you you were um, approved for the grant, gave you the start and end dates. So that's what we expect you to know and understand. But it's not unusual for our grantees to um, not have a whole lot of data to provide us in the first month or two. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's recruitment, there's all that stuff has to get started and you don't know whether you're going to get the funds until, you know, the last second. Um, so all that right. stuff is is expected. It's part of the reason why we do 18 month grants instead of 12 month grants in this funding stream. Uh, it gives you the time in order to be able to still meet your outcomes and, and get get things rolling and under and with the understanding that the first couple of months will be uh, slow kind of getting up and running. But once you get up and running, you'll have your classes kind of started and it's really just about recruiting additional participants going forward. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Anybody else like to? Um, yes, uh, Bill, this is Sangeeta Appel with uh, Home Instead. Um, I just had a question regarding, you know, you, you mentioned how uh, you put the reports in for the stipends or for the uh, vouchers. Um, so is that made out? I'm not quite sure the process. So do you pay them the voucher or does it come directly from you to them? Um, nope. Or is that something that gets reimbursed so that it gets more on a exactly. timely basis? Okay. Exactly. We reimburse you. So you pay it out up front. We reimburse you for it. Um, so at the end of the day, if you had stipends budgeted, you would give the stipends to your participants. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's mandated mandated that it's done uh, minimally biweekly. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, and then you would bill us and we would pay you back in the following month. OK, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. No, no problem. Any other questions? No, but I still need Bergen Community College and Barron Queens um, contacts. For... I think Chris put his in initial uh, right up front. If I remember correctly, I thought I saw it. Yeah, I can I can contact you directly on that and okay. um, not a problem at all. I'm, I'm I don't necessarily know that I'm going to be connected with the reporting, but I'm certainly um, a person of contact right now. So I or I can I'll reach out to you. OK. Thank you. Right, thank you. Bergen, how about you? Are you entering it or do you have um, a need to get that back to Lauren after the fact? Oh, never mind. <laughs> thank you. Right uh, <laughs> yeah, I am the AOR and the point of contact at this point, but Chinzia and Andrea would be people working on the grant every day. Perfect. Well, we're hiring our associate dean of health professions right now, our person is no longer with us so i'm in the process of interviewing the person that is going to be you know doing the really monthly leading, reports leading this effort and these okay. names can change throughout the 18 months it's just um just knowing who to go to directly helps cut down some of the back and forth um we also try reasons. to avoid uh reaching out to people who aren't re really responsible for the reports because that just fills your inbox with stuff uh, that you don't necessarily need to respond to. So, okay, so with that, do we have any other questions before we end the meeting? While I give everybody a chance to think of any questions they may have, I just want to make sure I give you next steps. So next steps are 
for all of you, you're going to work on getting the contracts completed and submitted. Once you've done that, we'll review them and uh, get them into executive review on our side for signature by our commissioner. But once you've submitted the reports, I mean the acti the um, the contracts to us, we will then submit to you these user guides that we just provided. At that time, that's when you'll be able to go in and start creating and and submitting those activity and expenditure reports. Um, you won't be able to start them even until the contracts have been signed by by your um, administration yourselves. So get those signed, submit it to us. We'll send you the user guides and you can start your reports. As I said, your first reports aren't going to even open up until April 1st, so you have uh, you know, a week or so to get those contracts signed off on. Um, then uh, starting April 1st, you'll open the reports and be able to go in and complete your activity and expenditure reports and then hopefully get them submitted by April 15th. If you have any problems or questions, please reach out to Lauren Kremper de Filippo uh, or just the apprenticeship unit at dol.nj.gov email address uh, and uh, she can help you with getting answers to those or extending any time if you needed additional time in order to get your reports submitted. Um, but those would be the next steps. Um, at this point, you should be actively recruiting participants, getting everything kind of up and running, you know, preparing for your classes to begin as soon as possible and um, ultimately working towards meeting the requirements of the grant, ultimately based on what you submitted as an application. Uh, Dr. Uh, Thenawala, do you want to Unmute yes. Yourself. Uh, so, so I have actually signed the contract. So, does that mean that I can uh, submit the report for February and March now? We not until not, not, not until, until April first, because technically okay. March isn't over yet. So, it would be right. hard for you to report on everything for March. So, starting April first, that's when you'll be able to. If you so, you've already signed the documents and changed I the status. Know, yeah. So yeah. it's in contract negotiations right now. OK, so then we'll uh, yeah. we'll check and make sure there's no issues with it so that we can let you know if there is anything um, that you need to do. You know, if we have to send it back to you for any reason, but it should be fine. Sounds good. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Katerina, if you'd like to unmute yourself, if you're not. Hi. Free. Hello. Hi, yes. I, can you hear me OK? Yes, perfect. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so we already had started recruiting because we um, yeah, we had already started recruiting and we're actually hiring uh, the position that we are going to be funding through the grant. Mm -hmm. So would that activity count towards helping to offset like coordinator and and um, supervision costs? Um, I'm not exactly following. What do you mean? Because uh, so if you started recruiting, if there were any costs incurred by the organization that were budgeted for 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 recruitment, then you could start billing on that. OK, if you had right. other positions that you haven't that you you know that were already filled by the organization uh, that were a part of that recruitment or um, marketing, you know, you could definitely bill for that. But it ultimately depends on how you had your money budgeted within the contract. We okay. do obviously expect that you uh, aren't billing for a large portion of the funds that were issued until participants have been enrolled, uh, but that's that, you know, in the, initially there is an expectation that there could be um, some costs incurred, you know, while you're working towards that process based on on the way your budget was was uh, approved and submitted to us initially. So OK, it's good. definitely yeah. allowed. Yes, great. Thank you. And if there was any concerns about it being too much of the of it that you're billing right away, we would reach out to you just to have conversation. It wouldn't necessarily mean we wouldn't approve it. We would just have that conversation. Any other questions? OK, so we'll be looking out to get all of your contracts in and reviewed uh, on our side. In the meantime, um, once you get that submitted to us, Lauren will send out to you the um, user guides and I will work on getting this recording uh, posted so that you guys can have it in case you need to share it with any other staff members. Uh, ultimately, thank you all. Um, congratulations again. We are very excited about 
this first round of fiscal year 24 getting started and, and working closely with all of you. And if you need us for anything, feel free to reach out to us here at uh, apprenticeship unit at dol.nj.gov. Take care, everybody. Thank you.